Good evening everybody, this is Katya Eckhart welcoming you to my video channel this evening. I just played um, that track by Gary Newman called Cars. Uh, it's a really cool uh, synthesizer driven new wave record. Probably one of the first new wave records that I became aware of uh, when that sort of music began to emerge in the States. Uh, this is one of my favorite tracks. So I wanted to play that. It's a really cool kind of eerie sounding uh, electronic, almost techno pop track. So I wanted to use that to set the tone for this evening because what I would like to do is return to the um, issue that I was discussing in my previous video. That has to do with this uh, new kind of theological conception where that we're seeking a kind of certainty, uh, a conception that has its roots in uh, Søren Kierkegaard but that I'm developing in a somewhat different direction. So it's almost like a tree that has its roots in Kierkegaardian soil, but I'm trying to develop it in a different direction that maybe has a more contemporary relevance. So let's remember that what we were saying the last couple of times is that God, the moral qualities of good or evil that God has uh, with respect to me, he doesn't have any moral qualities independently with respect to me at least, independently of how I choose to react to things that he has done, in particular his decision to become a human being, 
who then suffers, an innocent human being who suffers and dies on the cross in order to arouse sorrow in me, depending on how I feel about my sorrow and the fact that God has caused it in this way, whether I react negatively or positively to that, whether I feel good or bad about that, that's going to determine whether God is something good or bad for me, and I'm going to be responsible for whether God is good or bad with respect to me. Then last time we were saying that the same idea can be extended to the notion of whether God is something real for me as opposed to something that's merely possible or conceivable. That's going to come down to how I react to the story of like Abraham uh, or similar stories that I may read in the Bible or that I may hear about. Uh, if I'm inspired by those stories, then God will be something real for me because my inspiration and the reality of that will spill over or will be, will be the, um, the ground of God's reality for me. If I don't have that inspiration, then these will just be stories that, um, in which the characters, including God, is something, the characters are something possible or conceivable, but, but they're not, there's no reality there, there's no divine reality that, that I can point to. Now what I want to do this time is I want to explain how this conception relates to traditional ideas about the divine essence, and I also want to explain how this kind of Trinitarian view that I was beginning to sketch last time re relates to ideas about the Trinity that we find in both Western Christendom, that's like the Roman Catholic tradition followed by Protestantism on the one hand, and then the Eastern Orthodox tradition, which has a very different view. So let's go back to the Abraham story and just review briefly uh, what, what that story, the, the upshot of that story. So remember that what happens, and let me flesh it out a little bit more than I did last time. So God puts Abraham to the test, and, and he asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac, um, Abraham goes through all the motions and right as, about, as he's about to sacrifice Isaac, God stops him from doing that so that Abraham passes the test and is rewarded by getting his son back or never losing his son. And then he's also re re rewarded by being the ancestor of all the descendants that will, will um, emerge through Isaac. Those are the people, the children of Israel eventually. So Abraham is rewarded as a knight of faith. So what we have here is we have two characters. We have God who is a merciful tester because yes, he puts Abraham to the test, but he also at the last moments keeps him from going through with it and rewards him. And then we also have Abraham who's not just a knight of faith, but he's a rewarded knight of faith. That's his character. That's the character of Abraham that emerges from the story. And we saw that there is a kind of interdependence between these two roles or statuses or characters that emerge in the story. Because God, as the successful tester, has paternity with respect to Abraham, the rewarded knight of faith, because Abraham, Abraham cannot achieve that status unless God puts him to the test and then, you know, shows mercy. But by the same token, so Abraham also has filiation or sonship with respect to God, but it also goes the other way. There's an inverse. The same thing goes the other way because Abraham has paternity. The the success, the uh, rewarded knight of faith has paternity with respect to God, the successful tester. Because God can't be a successful tester unless Abraham actually passes the test and then goes through that. So so that God also has well Abraham has paternity with respect to God and God has filiation with respect to Abraham. That is, the, there's this mutual interrelationship or mutual dependency. Now, we also saw that the third component of this situation is the person who either reads about this, in, this story in the Bible or maybe hears about it and is inspired. And if this person is inspired to become a knight of faith himself or herself, suppose it's me, suppose that I am inspired to become a knight of faith, then both God, the successful tester, uh, the merciful tester, and Abraham, the rewarded, um, the, the rewarded knight of faith, those two characters together have paternity with respect to me because they inspire me to become a knight of faith 
So my status as someone inspired depends upon them. They have paternity with respect to me, and I have filiation with respect to them. But by the same token, they cannot be inspirers unless I'm inspired. And so I have paternity with respect to them, and they have filiation or sonship with respect to me. So this kind of interdependency obtains among each of the, each person in this, comp, this situation. And because my inspiration, which is my paternity and filiation, which is the paternity and filiation that both Abraham, the rewarded knight of faith, and God, the merciful tester, have, that's all the same thing. Since my inspiration, which is my paternity and filiation with respect to them, is real, their paternity and filiation with respect to me and with respect to each other, which is all the same thing, that's also real because my feeling is real. That's the sense in which my feelings are what, that particular feeling of being inspired is what makes God in this sort of Trinitarian structure real for me. If I don't feel that way, then the story remains nothing more than a story. The story remains God, the characters in it, both God, the successful, uh, the merciful tester, and Abraham, the um, rewarded knight of faith, they just remain conceivable, possible things. They, they, at least their sonship and paternity with respect to each other never become real. That only becomes real through my feeling. Now, how does all of this, first question, how does all of this relate to the notion of the divine essence? which is sort of like, well, Godhead, Godness, what, what is God's nature? Now, in what we could say here is there's a kind of interesting uh, self-dependency that emerges from the story, because if God, in, in, in each case, the three persons who are involved, all are kind of self-caused. God, remember, God, who is the uh, merciful tester, has paternity with respect to Abraham, who is the rewarded knight of faith, but Abraham also has paternity uh, with respect to God, um, so that so Abraham can't become that without God, but God can't become paternal with respect to Abraham unless Abraham passes the test. So God is kind of paternal with respect to himself, right? He is a self-cause. And similarly, Abraham is paternal with respect to God in the sense that well, God can't be a successful tester unless Abraham passes the test. So that, but then God has paternity with respect to Abraham. So since Abraham has respect paternity with respect to God, and God has respect a paternity with respect to Abraham, Abraham, insofar as he emerges as a, a rewarded knight of faith, has paternity with respect to him. The same thing is true of me if I'm inspired. Yes. It's true that God, and, and who is the merciful tester, and Abraham, who is the uh, rewarded knight of faith, they inspire me, and so they have paternity with respect to me, but I have paternity with respect to them. They can't be inspirers unless they inspire me. So if I have paternity with respect to them, and they have return paternity with respect to me, I also, insofar as I'm inspired in this way, have paternity with respect to myself. So my point is that in this structure, in this situation we're discussing, each person, each character, is kind of a self-cause. It has paternity with respect to itself. It's self-generating, and the tradition has understood that to be another way of saying that the paternity involved is a necessity. That, that, that's kind of a nature that each of these persons within this interplay uh, in the story, each of the characters has that. So that the persons, if you want to understand what the divine nature is here, that, that means that you have to look at the, the persons first. You don't start with some general notion of the divine essence, godness or godhood, and then work your way out to the persons. Rather, you start with the persons, and then you sort of think your way back to this notion of self-causing paternity that each one of them exemplifies, and that's what the divine nature is. Now, that puts the position that I 
am developing here closer to the Eastern Orthodox tradition because traditionally there, the Trinity, the persons of the Trinity are understood to have priority to the divine essence. In other words, thinkers or theologians, people of faith in that tradition, they, when they think about divinity or God, they start by thinking about the divine persons and then they work their way to the essence. Whereas in the Western Catholic and Protestant tradition, it goes the other way as a rule, and that is that people start with this notion of a kind of uni divine essence, and then they think about the persons as like relations within that or something, but the point is that they start with the divine essence, and then they work their way to the persons. That's not what happens here. So in that respect, the view that we're discussing here, the view that, that I'm developing out of Kierkegaardian soil, is closer to the Eastern tradition. But there's another sense in which it's closer to the West. What is that? Well, what's interesting is that in Eastern Orthodox theology, and I don't want to get into this too much, but I think it's interesting just to mention it in passing. Uh, what happens is that the Father, in, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so the Father is kind of like, he generates, or he is the source of both the Son and the Spirit equally. He generates both of them. Now this leads to the question, well, you know, what, what makes them different then? Why aren't they both sons? Why is one a son? Well, why is the other one a father? I'm sorry, why is the other one a spirit? Why is one a son? Since they're both equally proceeding, let's use that terminology, from the father. Now, in the Western tradition, it doesn't work that way. It's that the son proceeds from the father, and then the spirit proceeds from the father and the son jointly. And if you look at the situation I've been discussing in connection with fear and trembling, that is the story of Abraham, where we have God, who is the merciful tester, who, and then we have Abraham, who passes the test and is rewarded, then together, only together, do they inspire or give spirit to someone who reads the story or hears that story and becomes a knight of faith. So that here, the spirit or the inspiration proceeds, as it does in the Western tradition, from both the Father and the Son jointly. It doesn't simply proceed from the Father alone, as in the way that the Son proceeds from the Father alone. That doesn't happen. So I think it's important to put this position, uh, to situate it in relation to this kind of um, theological, these different theological traditions. And in a way, it's similar and dissimilar to each one, both East and West, in different ways. So that's what I wanted to do this evening. Now, next time, um, what I want to do is I want to come back to, I want to go to another question um, that maybe is a little more existential, and that has to do with the question of evil. So in particular, if whether God is an actuality for me is going to come down to how whether I'm inspired by the story of Abraham and Isaac or a similar story in the Bible like that or not, um, then what if I'm not inspired by that? What if I'm indifferent to it? Or what if, like uh, Johannes Silentio in Fear and Trembling, I just get a deer in the head like look about that and I'm completely puzzled by it, I'm completely nonplussed by it, and so I don't know what to make of it, so then God isn't real for me. Well, what, what happens then to the business of, well, how am I punished? You know, what is, in other words, in some sense, I, in some way I can no longer, I cannot enter into some kind of, you know, close friendship with God. I can't be saved. I can't go to heaven. That's the traditional way of putting it. Well, how does that work if there isn't any God? How can God punish me if he doesn't exist? And what about other things like the devil and demons and all the other things that, uh, Christianity, at least in its traditional expression, has said a part of the universe, a part of the creation. Um, if God doesn't exist because I don't have this inspiration, at least it doesn't exist for me, um, then what happens to all that stuff? I want to come back to that next time. But that's what I wanted to talk about this evening and also play a little Gary Neiman for you. So I hope that you enjoyed that. And again, I thank you all for sharing some time with me this evening. I hope that you found this video interesting, and I hope that you will continue to watch. I really do appreciate uh, your spending time with me. So until next time, 
This is Katya Eckhart, and I wish everybody a restful, a peaceful, and a blessed good evening. Bye-bye.